Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you are here in our midst, God. You reign victorious, Lord God. And we pray, God, as we go through this service this afternoon or this morning or this evening, wherever we're watching, God, we pray that you would go before us, Lord God. Thank you that you are going before, before the church in this time, Father, and you're taking us to a new place, Father. So we say we want to be those who are listening, who hear and follow you in this time, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. But it's really nice to have some more people in the room. How are you doing? Lovely to see you. If you're at home, welcome. Great to have you. Let's give an applause for those you haven't seen for ages. I know we've got new faces, but I'm not quite sure because people are wearing masks. So I think if you're welcome, if you're here for the first time, you know, welcome uh, to church. You know, it's been a kind of a strange time. How many people are so excited that their kids are going back to school on Monday? Yes! We've had four at home and it's been quite the challenge. You know, I find school was a challenge for me as it was, but I remember just a few weeks ago, Honey came down and said, Dad, can you help me with my French homework? And if it had been any other subject, I'd be like, no way, speak to mum. But uh, I got, oh yes, an A star in French. I thought, no problem, I can do this. We can do the French. So she came down, it's not cheating, by the way, when you're helping your daughter. And it was this live quiz, but we're going to show them how good you are at French. And we came in in 11th place. In other words, I got beat by 11-year-olds at French. How humbling is that, guys? I mean, do you feel like humbled in this time? You're kind of trying to do the best you can. And uh, Honey said to me, totally like, I thought you were my father, look. I thought you loved me. She said to me, Dad, she's 11, my life is just on hold right now. It's on hold. And uh, I don't know if you feel like your life is on hold, your education has been on hold, or maybe your career has been on hold, or your relationships have been on hold. But often when you look at the Bible, when people's lives are on hold, often they're the moments that God sanctifies, speaks in and says, it's time to leave the past behind. You know, Gideon's hiding in a wine press and the angel of the Lord comes to him and says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Mo is hiding in the desert. Moses, that's his short name. And God says to him through a burning bush, you know, take off your Havianas. You're standing on holy ground. And today we're going to look at this one comment on Joshua. And it says this, and Joshua again, his life has been on hold. It says this, consecrate yourself for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things things amongst you. I think this is a word for the church in this time. We stand at the precipice of a new year of God about to do new things. And he's saying, consecrate yourself. This new King James says, sanctify yourselves. In other words, set yourselves apart because I'm about to do wonders among you. You know, consecration is the action of declaring or dedicating something to be holy, okay? So it actually can be a place. So if you think about it, we often look at sacred places, like monasteries were known as sacred places. So when the Visigoths sacked Rome in the fourth century, okay, they they suddenly this Pax Romana, or Roman peace, which is kind of a peace if you're on the good side of the Romans, which we kind of operated all around Europe and Asia Minor, suddenly dissipated. Rome, a city of a million people, just by seven centuries later, went to be a city of just 30,000 people. So the church rose up and created these sacred spaces known as monasteries. I used to go around monasteries and cathedrals with my parents when I was a kid, and I'd be like the gingerbread man from Shrek, like, boring, but how how bad is this? But now I love monasteries and cathedrals. I'm sorry, how sad is that? My kids are like, how sad are you? But I love them because they became these sacred spaces where they would take on refugees, they would feed the poor. They would have excellence in the arts. They would exemplify what the future kingdom of God looked like in the now time. That's why we were talking about our vision next week. It's so important because we're about to establish the food bank and the foundation, a college, 
uh, we're about to establish a kind of new worship music as we launch into our futures. We're about to establish so many things, even to plant other sites maybe as we go along. Didier is about to establish his centre there near in Paris. But we believe that these are going to become homes that are sacred for this generation and the generation that are coming. But consecrate also means something else. And this is where we're going to fo- focus today. It's the action of ordaining someone to a sacred office. You know, when we hear that kind of cry from Joshua, consecrate yourselves to God for, you know, tomorrow will do wonders amongst you, it sounds very kind of like we will fight them on the beaches, kind of very stirring, triumphant speech. But the bottom line was Joshua had spent 40 years in the desert. It started so well. It looked so good. They got released from slavery. And then do you remember that moment that Moses was up in the mountain? He comes down the mountain. He's encountered the Lord. He's got the Ten Commandments like Cholton Heston. He arrives down the bottom. And the people have got a golden calf. They were worshipping the Egyptian fertility God. And he's like, this is going to be a long journey. And it didn't stop there. They were always complaining. They could never shrug off the people of Israel, this victim mentality that the world owed them something. And it was always Mo, what he was doing wrong. There was no food. Do you remember, he, they would say things like, you've brought us out into the desert to die. And Moses is like, no, no, you will not die like dogs in the desert. You will fight like lions. That's not actually in the Bible. That was in the Three Amigos, but I thought I'd try and squeeze it in there. And they're like, Mo, you don't even know the Bible. You're using the Three Amigos sketch to kind of engage us. And he's like, uh, okay. And then they're like, there's no, there's no food. So God sends manna. And uh, there's no meat. So God sends quail. And there's no water. So Moses strikes the rock. But they continue to complain, and in the end, they want to stone Moses. And towards the end of the story, they want him dead. They want Joshua dead. But despite all of this, God takes them to the point, the new frontier of the promises of God, the promised land. He gives them an opportunity, and they say, we felt like grasshoppers. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, but they felt like grasshoppers. And their enemies looked like giants. They weren't grasshoppers. Their enemies weren't giants. They just couldn't shrug off the past. They couldn't let go of what was. They couldn't release this victim mentality. Sometimes we like to have these kind of triumphant missionary or missional stories about our past. And I can imagine... Joshua just kind of slouching. And it's interesting, isn't it, that in Joshua 1, four times, uh, God says to to Joshua, have I not told you to be strong and courageous? Um, Be strong and courageous. Uh, By the way, have I said it already? But be strong and courageous. Book end of the chapter. Be strong and courageous. Why did he keep saying that? Because He didn't feel like he was strong and courageous. He had serious amount of baggage.com hanging around in his life. And sometimes things happen in life, whether you're a pastor's kid or a missionary or maybe in your business or maybe it's in your relationship and you think this is a chocolate-coated turd moment. Did anyone get that word? I know that was deeply theological, but you think it looks so good. We bit into it and it's like, oh, that's nasty. And we have to have these times in our life where we say we are going to let go of the past. It wasn't their exterior that destroyed their hopes. It was their interior, what was going on. And we can be holders, can't we? We can be holders in our our relationships with people. You know, we we were in, in France as missionaries with our parents. I mean, you've heard these grand stories of Didier, the great break dancer, getting saved. Jeremy, his son's over there in the room. And we're like, it was amazing, and God moved, and we prayed all night. And, but I also remember these moments where we were getting dragged into complete French-speaking schools. We didn't speak a word of French, and we were kind of like, this is one of those chocolate-covered moments. 
And I remember watching Joe, my younger brother, kicking and screaming because he couldn't handle it, being pulled into one of these French-speaking schools. And we can be people that hold on. Yes, it was amazing. It was good. God moved. But we can hold on to these memories where actually it was hard in the moment. There's a lot of consecrating and sanctifying that has to happen as we go into what God has called us. You know, one of my favorite, and Ben, we were talking about this this week, one of my favorite heroes of faith is John Wesley. And if I ever go to the London um, City Museum, I always have a picture next to John Wesley. And he was this incredible guy. Hundreds of thousands of people were saved through his ministry You know, when he died, he had nothing but a silver spoon in his pocket because he gave everything away to the poor. But then as you dig down and you read about his life, one of his, some of his words towards his wife was, in 1758 was, I hope to never see your wicked face again. And he had this horrendous marriage and kind of if he was in ministry today, I'd say he wouldn't even be allowed to be in ministry. He had no relationships at all with his children and kind of he would travel with some lady friends and write very affectionate letters to other women and we're like, oh, John, I've had a picture taken with you and I just, I love you so much, you're just my hero and suddenly someone has popped my ideal of how you used to minister and fast and the temptation is in life is we become holders instead of people that release others and forgive them along the journey. You know, sometimes I think it's almost like we've got files on people. Do you guys have files on people? And um, if there's any millennials or Zs watching, this was a computer in the Gen X days. Uh, so there it is, you put information in it and you stored it. They're worth a lot of money now. These, that's a, a Beasley or Beasley. It's a bit of an antique, 50p that's going for after the service if anyone wants to take it off our hands. We kind of, I don't know about you, but you a holder, you get files on people, don't you? So we have files on family, files on friends, files on, well, you know, on friends from back in the day. Like I've got a file on, on, anyone got a file on their dad? File on their dad, and yeah, he, 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 yeah, he never attended our ball games. So I'm, I'm keeping that file, that's going in my drawer. We have files on our school friends. Do you know, do you remember the time that Justin, your mate, stole your girlfriend? You got a file on them, and it's a good thing he stole a girlfriend. She hasn't aged well. I've seen her on Facebook, but, but but you know, it's kind of like Justin. He's, he's in my file. He's in my file. I'm holding on to that. Then there are spouse issues. Anyone want to put their hand up? They can come and grab a file straight off me. They're handing out. They're going for free. You know, there's moments when you come home and you kind of light a candle. You get Barry White on, and then your wife's like, "I've got a headache," and you're like. That's a file. That's a file. But there's a few files for that one. That's going into my file. February file, headache. December file, headache. A lot of files going in that drawer right there. And then there are ministry files. You know, it's Easter Sunday and we're talking about the resurrection, the future heaven and the new earth, and it's incredible. And then on Monday morning, we get that email, and it's Dear Reverend Warren, uh, I hate your guts. You're like, great. I brought my mum to church for the first time, and she got one of those coffee stirring sticks stuck in her eye, and I've looked online, and those coffee stirring sticks, they're not even legit coffee stirring sticks. Okay, I've checked it out with a board from 1880, and that stirring stick is over one centimetre too long to be used in a coffee shop. Dear Mr. Warren, I hate your guts. I hope you die very slowly. Your brother in Christ. That's a file. Anyone had an email like that? That's going straight in the file. Then it's just gen- general comments. Growing up as a pastor's kid and your dad's had like these rust buckets for cars and you're kind of like, you know, someone just says, you know, he finally gets a new car where it's fourth generation, hand me down new car. And someone's like, hey, nice, nice car pastor. And you're like, yeah, yeah, because his, his donkey broke its leg. Like, that's what happened. What was your name? That's in my file. That's going in my file. Then there are friends in your life. And they're kind of like, look, you shouldn't be taking these things to heart. You know, hurting people hurt people. You know, when people criticize you, it's more about the, the critique than what it is for you. And we're kind of like, you know, time is a healer. And it's kind of meant 
to, to do you some good, and people have the noblest intention of encouraging you at times, don't they? But when it's you on the end of the stick, or when it's you that's come through that marriage which has crumbled, or when it's you that have kind of gone into education and it's not worked out, you're like, I'm feeling, I'm feeling the pain right now. There's going to be a file on that, a file on friends' comments as well. And then there's living in community for all the students that are here. There's living in community and you're kind of in the flat and you've got a fridge and people, I remember once when I was a little kid, these students came, Dan would probably relate to this, people just came into our flat, took all the food out of our fridge and they were like, I was like, they were like, this, that's not your food anyway, it's the church's, it's, it's your tithe. Like, okay, I was like, okay, thanks a lot students, so you have, to, you have to learn to get over that, that goes in the file. So over time, we develop this kind of Jackie Cholton complex. I don't know if anyone knows Jackie Cholton, Pay for England. Was it Leeds as well? And he used to have a little black book. And if you kicked him in a game or went through him, he would write your name, your number, and your club in his little black book. And he might not get you back that game. It might not even be that same season. But over the next two or three years, he would find you and he would give it back to you. He would hold on, and some of us do that, don't we? We kind of hold on to this stuff, and some of this stuff is really noble things, aren't they? John Wesley, what a noble guy. But someone's got even a John Wesley folder, it's gone in there. It's on Google, you can get the information. So we put it in our file. And then, after these complexes and things we're holding, we develop this thing called self-hatred. And you're kind of like just, you hate yourself because you're like, I cannot believe that I get so sick and so angry about such stupid little things. We kind of experience a slow death by filing cabinet. And this filing cabinet becomes like an anchor that we carry around with us, with us, but unless we address it, it eventually starts to drag us down to the bottom of the ocean. We have to learn to get rid of and cancel people's debts. I mean, it's scary. It's, it sounds funny. I'm giving you some really kind of shallow, small kind of things that have happened. But you know in your heart of heart, there's some big stuff that happens that we don't release and we hold on to. And it's gradually making us sink. Holding on to stuff just makes people cynical. They hold back from ministry. There's vengeance or revenge by silence. I remember someone once said to me, you know, does it make any difference that one person makes a decision online, you don't even know where they are or who they are? Is there any point? I was like, guys, years ago when we were younger, like we would do youth on Friday, we would drive to do a gig in Glasgow on Saturday, there'd be like one hand go up, someone would make a commitment to Christ or maybe they were just scratching their head, we never really knew. We would drive back from Glasgow the same night, we would do Sunday church and then we would sit in the afternoon just sort of basking with no energy, absolutely tired, but like saying, wow, God moved in such a powerful way. Thank you for using me, for letting me be part of this story. But once we start holding on to stuff, we soon and quickly become cynical, cynical about even the best things, the best things of what God has done in our past and is about to do in our future. You can't go into the future holding on to cynicism, holding back. You know, sometimes people are like, yeah, they're just, they, there's this revenge through silence happens, doesn't it? Well, I served the church or I was involved in my community. I was involved in my business for 15 years. Now you've got a 15-year-old doing the MC. What happened there? And instead of just having this simple faith, of letting things go, they commit revenge via silence. Sometimes it's actual revenge, it's cynicism and it's gossiping, but often it's just by withdrawing quietly and slowly. This is a huge subject and it's scary. It is really scary. And I want to say this comment, and I read this and I was like, 
Ouch, I need to pause on it. A life of unforgiveness leads toward a road called apostasy. A, ro- a life of unforgiveness leads towards a road called apostasy where you don't even have a faith anymore because you've held on to stuff and instead of going step by step forward in humility, you've taken a detour and suddenly you are miles away from what God has called you to be and to have. Matthew 6, Jesus says it really clearly in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. And this is the end of the Lord's prayer. And we often, this bit gets skipped over, but it's his last statement. It says this, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Holding on to the past is detrimental and will destroy our future walk with the Lord. You know, we have to break this myth or this illusion of community that people are perfect. You know, your parents will fall short. Your children will fall short of your expectations. Your organisations will fall short of your expectations. Do you know why? Because you fall short of your expectations. That's why sometimes when people say to me, you know those people, they're a bunch of hypocrites for doing this. And I always say, yes, we are a bunch of hypocrites. Because I don't know about you, but I've realised the more law, the more things I've tried to apply to my own life, the more I fall short We can't even live up to our own standards. That's why we need grace. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, this incredible pastor, he was in England and he went to obviously confront Hitler during the war. And he was in community before this. He said, the sooner this shock of disillusionment comes to an individual and to a community, the better for both. Every human wish dream that has injected into the Christian community is a hindrance to genuine community and must be banished if genuine community is to survive. He who loves his dream of a community more than the Christian community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter. Even though his personal intentions may be ever so honest and ever so earnest and sacrificial, the man who fashions a visionary ideal of community demands that it be realised by God, by others and by himself. He enters the community of Christians with his demands, sets up his laws and judges the brethren and God himself accordingly. The moment when we try to do community together, they say, I am not going to forgive you. I am good and you are bad. Two things happen. Either we start looking down our nose at people and we start to become judge and juror and condemn other people or we die ourselves, we are crushed by our own inability to live up to our own expectations because in the middle of the night we know we also fall short. We have to forgive one another, which means making a choice of canceling other people's debts. Not some of their debts, but all of their debts. Remember that moment when Peter came to Jesus? He's like, how many times should I forgive them? Like seven times, once for every day of the week. Seven is the number of perfection. And Jesus says, what does he say? 77 times. In other words, it's unlimited. Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord all my soul and forget not all his benefits. We forget his benefits, don't we? Who forgives all your iniquities. Put all in the chat who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction. He He redeems all your life from destruction. And listen to this. I mean, this is the grace of God, who then crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Jesus on the cross cancels our debt in full. Therefore, it's unforgivable 
not to forgive others. God asks us if we're going to make this thing called community work, if we're going to go into the promises of God, into the promised land, if we're going to build incredible church, we've got to be a people who counsel people's debt. And you know what? The only way to do it is through becoming a great practitioner. If you want to be a great speaker, you've got to practice. If you want to be a great sportsman, you've got to practice. You've got to learn, you've got to exercise, you've got to eat well. The way you become someone that cancels debt is through not pulling away from community, but by gathering around a community and practicing this thing saying, I choose to cancel your debt. You know, I heard this story of this woman, this pastor was just speaking and uh, this lady was just sobbing through the whole service and uh, after the service finished, he went to her and said, you know, are they good tears or are they bad tears? She said, no, they're, they're, they're good tears. And she told her, him his, his story and her story and she, she said, look, I went through this really painful divorce and uh, I was recommended to go and see a psychiatrist. When I went to see the psychiatrist, the guy raped me. And then I took the psychiatrist to court and I lost the court case. He said, look, I've got a picture of my six-year-old son and he's from what happened that night. She said, my whole life has been consumed in creating files on that man's life and what he did to me. I've relived it. I've had imaginary consequences. I've had imaginary conversations. I've looked for the day of revenge. But today, I'm choosing to cancel his debt. Holding on is destroying me. I feel literally like I've been put in the hands of a tormentor. But today, I'm going to cancel his debt. See, forgiveness isn't always about the other person, no matter how big or how small. Some of us can heal relationships, but forgiveness is about you. Forgiveness is a gift to you. It's a gift to me. And we have to commit to cancelling debt. Tim Keller says, there is another option, however. You can forgive. Forgiveness means refusing to make them pay for what they did. That's hard, isn't it? However, to refrain from lashing out at someone when you want to do so with all your being is agony. It's a form of suffering. You're absorbing the debt, taking the cost of it completely on yourself instead of taking it out on that other person. It hurts terribly. Many people would say it feels like a form of death. Yes, but it's a death that leads to resurrection instead of a lifelong living death of bitterness and cynicism. We have to be a people who step out. And sometimes when we start to forgive, it's painful. We're going to just practice this together Uh, in a minute. We're going to take communion together. So if you're in your home, gather the, the elements, the wine and the bread. You know, Paul actually says, doesn't he, in Corinthians, that if you've got resentment, bitterness, weigh up whether you should even take the sacraments. Because you, you will pour judgment on yourself. That's how powerful forgiveness can be. So what I want us to do today as a church is just work through this right where we are. I recognise that some of this will take more than just an hour service on a Sunday and that's why being part of life groups is so important or meeting with a friend, you can go to connect at newlifechurch.me or nlccuk.me and we'd love to spend more time with you working through some of these challenges but um, first thing we need to do is identify what has been taken from you. So I'm saying, you know, have you ever met those guys? They're like, I love everyone, I forgive everyone. And then they're like ranting and raving at people all through the week. And you're like, that doesn't sound like a heart that is living out of counselling debt. You have to identify it. You have to make a decision to counsel the debt. 
Okay, remember, you, we're not operating on how we feel. Jesus, before the cross, said, look, take this cup away from me. He did not want to go forward with it, but not my will, but your will be done. You've got to choose to absorb the pain. You're choosing the hard road. And then number three, refuse to hold the debt against them. It means you're no longer committed to writing out files and putting them in your filing cabinet, creating an anchor that is going to sink you. And you've got to, we have to become, as a church, practitioners of cancelling debt and not writing out files. Because if we do, we will be held back from what God wants from us. We will be like the Israelites with this victim mentality, never able to get out of the desert and never walking into the spiritual calling that God has for us. So let's pray this prayer. Do you want to just pray it after me? And then we'll just pause and we'll just reflect and we'll just take communion afterwards. Let's close our eyes where we are. Father, I recognise that at Calvary, I lost my right not to forgive. Thank you for forgiving me. God, I've been harbouring anger in my heart against. You give that person right now to the Lord. If you feel you can't give that person to the Lord, maybe that's exactly the very thing that God is calling you towards. If you can't write their name down, then maybe they're the person you need to set free. Father, I feel like I've been a victim and they have robbed me of reputation, love, relationship, support, a home, a family, peace. What have they robbed you? Right now, God, Give me the strength. Give me the energy. Empower me, Holy Spirit. I cancel their debt. In Jesus' name. Just as you did for me on the cross. I cancel their debt. In Jesus' name. Thank you for the cross. Please help me to make my memories a reminder of your grace and forgiveness and healing in my own life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Maybe your this has been one of the first times you've even heard this idea of forgiveness and holding was your culture. Little black books were your culture waiting for payback time. It's very fashionable, isn't it? We're a culture of payback. But God's leading us into a culture of grace. You know, God has a a calling on your own life. And maybe this whole idea of forgiveness is new. Well, guess what? God wants you to come into a relationship with him. He wants you to experience his forgiveness right now in his life. So if, if that's you, you think, well, I'm new to this journey. I've been holding on. Or maybe you've been around Christians. Maybe you've got a grandparent that was a Christian. But you've never, you feel you're like the person walking around with a huge anchor, a filing cabinet, and it's killing you. And you know, this is the moment that I need to be a follower of Jesus and get that cut off and let go. Just pray this prayer with me. Father God, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for the power of forgiveness. God, I realise I can't even live up to my own expectations, let alone be a judge and juror of other people. Today, I commit my life to walking with you. Fill me. Give me the strength through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you've said that prayer for the first time, 
as we take communion and as we reflect with this song that's coming up, just let us know in the chat. Just say, yes, today I've chosen to be forgiven by God. Let us know on YouTube or on Facebook. Send an email to connect at nlccuk.com and we'll get back to you, or .org, and we'll get back to you. So let's just reflect for a while. Amen.